Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a great Jamstack conference. Uh, let's get started. So today's topic table is uh, Jamstack e-commerce at scale. So in this topic table, we're going to discuss the issues and lessons learned from applying Jamstack and headless commerce to sites with large catalogs or frequent updates uh, that typically face challenges, uh, which we'll discuss. Um, if you're you know, considering Jamstack or trying Jamstack on an e-commerce platform like Salesforce Commerce Cloud, Magento, SAP Commerce Cloud, also known as um, Hybris, or HCL Commerce, formerly known as WebSphere, you are in the right place. This is your kind of our person and who we want to be talking to. So let's get started. Um, I do want to hear your thoughts. Uh, the way we're structuring this topic table is uh, we'll talk for about oh, 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, this is just kind of a, a thought starter. Uh, but we'll spend a lot of time talking about what we've learned, and then we want to hear from you guys. Um, let's keep going. So uh, things I want you to be thinking about as we uh, get to the second half of this and we talk about what people have learned. We'd love to hear from folks, you know, what build times they're seeing, how many pages their site is, uh, how frequently are you updating it, what framework are you using, what CMS, uh, what commerce platform, and what your infrastructure is for building the site out. Um, first off, who am I, who are we? So I'm Ishan, I'm the CTO at MoveWeb. Uh, I may be joined shortly by our VP of engineering in a second, um, but we like to say we make the web instant and simple. Um, so we make it very fast. Um, but we also make it easy for front-end developers. We're essentially a developer platform that's the home for your headless front-end. And our jam is really bringing the benefits of the Jamstack in terms of performance, in terms of developer happiness to large complex e-commerce sites. Household names that you see down there like Sharper Image, Shoe Carnival, that's, that's our jam. Uh, and our platform supports a variety of frameworks that are popular uh, with front-end developers in the Jamstack. So React, Angular, Vue, uh, of course, Next and Nuxt. But we also support commerce-focused frameworks that are less well-known, but really great for e-commerce. So Vue Storefront is a very popular one based on Nuxt. A similar thing, but for React is React Storefront, which is based on Next.js. And then we're even starting to support frameworks like SAP Spartacus. That is a open source front-end framework that is published by SAP Commerce Cloud that works with their e-commerce platform for those who want to go headless. Uh, so we're really supporting the full gamut of frameworks. And then just for Jamstack Conference, we have a special offer. Reach out to us, drop by our booth, uh, contact me, uh, free unlimited bandwidth in Q4 of 2020 if you're on a qualifying framework. Uh, definitely reach out if you're interested in that. Okay, let's talk about the challenges uh, people are having at scale. Um, and there's a lot of them. For the purposes of the first half of this, I'm going to focus on the ones on the left. Build times, frequent updates, site migrations, dynamic data, personalization, and A-B testing. And then if you guys want to talk about the stuff on the right, happy to go into more details on them. The stuff on the left is very common and is usually the, the majority of the use cases. So I'm going to focus on those. So let's talk about build time friction. So Jamstack, you know, at scale is kind of in the title here. And the default answer is, well, Jamstack has high traffic scalability built in. Um, but the build step introduces a new scaling dimension, actually two. As the number of pages on the site or frequency of changing pieces, you kind of exit this sweet spot of where the Jamstack is really, really fast and agile. And you get to build time friction, either for your developers or for you know, the other people who build your site. My, my new motto is actually sites are built as much by non-developers as they are by developers. So whether that's your content folks or your merchandisers constantly changing things, um, that build time friction can get in the way. And it's really important to understand that, that scale happens. Um, and it happens more than you would think on the internet. So here on the left, we've got, you know, in the commerce vertical, I'm using number of SKUs as a proxy for number of pages for site complexity. So here, Revolve Fashion has 40,000 SKUs. Um, Staples Online, 200,000 SKUs. Um, a lot of people think millions of SKUs. Oh, that's only for Amazon. Uh, not true. Um, so Auto Parts is a great example. If you've ever gone to an Auto Parts site, you know they're going to ask you for what they call YMMV, 
year make model vehicle uh, to make sure you get the Honda Pilot of that particular year uh, with that particular trim level if you get the right tire or accessory for that, that car. So here's an example. This is TruePar. They're actually B2B just forklift parts. They have 8 million SKUs. Um, and then at the higher end, we can talk about Amazons. They're like 300. Instacart's 200 million. Um, let's talk about content. Uh, that's the one on the right. You've got BuzzFeed, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post doing, you know, roughly about 100,000 stories just per year. Forget about their archives. So scale happens, and it happens for the biggest sites on the internet that are actually driving a large part of the, you know, internet economy, not just e-commerce. Like, it's a little creepy when that ad follows you around the web, but that's actually how a lot of uh, the internet is monetized and effectively powered financially. Um, and on top of this, we've got A-B testing and personalization, which is just a whole other layer of complexity. And so it's a really important question of how do we jam stackify these sites? How do we bring the benefits of the jam stack to such large, large sites with large build times? So there's a couple of solutions, and we're going to just kind of give you a quick survey of what those are. Uh, I've broken them into static and dynamic techniques. Let's jump into them. So the first thing is to optimize your build times. Now you can go in tactically and look at where your build is spending time and, and try to optimize that. But from an architectural or strategic level, there's a couple of techniques. The first thing is incremental builds. And this is where you save the build artifacts, you cache them, Netlify is a, a cache plugin, uh, for example. And whenever you need to rebuild the site, you only regenerate what's changed. Now, if let's say only a single page has changed, then you don't have to regenerate that single page. If you've maybe changed something in your code, hopefully it doesn't have to regenerate everything that's an artifact of that build, and it can improve your build time. Parallel builds. This basically lets the framework take the work of taking your build and splitting across multiple processes or threads. This is really, really helpful for that part of your build step that's image processing. And we have a call out here for Gatsby Parallel Runner, which is from Netlify, uh, which is a great example of doing this. Another thing to evaluate is looking at alternative static site generators. And if you look at the ecosystem, what you'll find is that the natively coded static site generators report much better build times. So Hugo, which is written in Go, and Nift, which is written in C++, can be dramatically better, as we'll talk about. The caveats here are framework and cloud provider support for parallel and incremental builds varies. Um, not all of them support it. They all support it to varying degrees. Um, the framework may support it, but only on a certain cloud provider. Um, there's also this question of potential excess cost. If you have large pages, hundreds of thousands, millions, and you know most of your traffic follows a power distribution, you're actually spending extra compute time, which is really extra cost, potentially rebuilding pages that will never get visited. And the more you do updates, the more you're going to pay that cost. So uh, keep that in mind as well when we talk about some of the dynamic techniques. So here's an example from Gatsby. These are Gatsby cloud build times that they publish on their site, willit.build. Um, and you can see coming from Contentful and WordPress, it's basically about 200 milliseconds per page. So if you're doing a 10K page site, uh, in fact, we just had somebody at the booth who had 10,000 products roughly, that's a 25 minute full build. Now, if you've got an incremental build and the right amount of change happens, it can get down to one minute. And that's the power of incremental builds. It can be really helpful as long as you don't have to do full builds. Uh, I mentioned native static site generators. So Hugo and Nift are, are two callouts here. Um, these are stats on a 10,000 page example. Now to be fair, that 10,000 page example, there are very minimal pages. Um, but basically they're talking about you know, four and a half to one and a half seconds for 10,000 pages using Nift and Hugo. Um, and then actually earlier today, uh, there was a presentation, a lightning launch from the folks at Toast um, who gave us permission to, to use a slide, but he's introducing a static site generator, again, coded in Rust, uh, and he's getting really good page generation times. Okay, let's talk about client-side rendering. So a lot of folks probably are aware of this as the app shell or SPA fallback model. So uh, what you have here is uh, CDN routing that takes all your products. Let's say you've got, you know, uh, in this case, nearly a million products, all of those are getting routed by the CDN layer into the index.html, all getting served the same static file. And that static file just contains an app shell and a client-side router. And then when that page is loaded by the browser, the client-side router will fetch and render the page content in the browser. 
And what you can do with this approach is now you can effectively host an infinite number of pages. The caveat with client-side rendering is it may negatively impact the performance because that page can't render until the JavaScript shows up. And you know, moving forward, Google actually told us the metrics they're gonna look at. They're gonna look at first input delay, LCP and cumulative layout shift, what they call the core web vitals. And client-side rendering can actually negatively impact all of these, especially actually cumulative layout shift. It's, it's not impossible, but it's kind of hard to get a good CLS with an app shell model. You basically have to create custom versions of the app shell for each type of page. Um, it may also negatively impact your SEO. So first, because of performance, and performance impacts your SEO, as we talked about. Um, but also, some bots cannot read this, this content because it's entirely rendered by JavaScript. Now, Google does say they can render JavaScript and interpret it, but other bots cannot, and in particular, social you know, search engines and social networks can't. And for a lot of sites, that's a big significant amount of their traffic. And so those preview links won't look as good if you're using an approach like this. So the, the third caveat here is that it requires provider support to do this mapping. Um, and some do it more elegantly than others. If you're on say AWS CloudFront, you have to basically shoehorn this in through their 404 page support, um, or you kind of have to write some Lambda at edge handlers. Um, thankfully, the Jamstack platforms, Netlify, Vercel, and ourselves at MoveWeb offer a fairly easy way to enable this. Uh, here in Netlify, they have a redirects file. Uh, and if you return a 200, it's what they call a, a rewrite. So it's a hidden redirect that the user never sees and it'll basically end up proxying. Uh, Vercel has rewrite support in the Vercel JSON. It also integrates very tightly with Next. So if you're specifying your rewrites in Next natively, those get pulled out. The same thing actually happens on MoveWeb as well. We also will read out your Next rewrites as well. Um, but we also, for other frameworks, support a app shell command in our CDN as JavaScript, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So another approach is incremental static generation and also incremental static regeneration uh, pioneered by the, the folks uh, Next.js. And this will generate new static pages on demand in response to incoming traffic. So the way this works is the browser requests a new page that has not yet been visited and the CDN will quickly return back for every page, regardless of what the path is, uh, a universal fallback page that only contains really placeholder skeletons. Uh, doesn't really have any content. And while that fallback is being displayed, the page's individual static build process is being run. And when that build finally completes, the fallback page will load the static JSON data and display the final page. In addition, future visits will actually get the statically built HTML. So what this is gradually doing is you can imagine a site that has no pages built out and as traffic comes in, it's gradually building out the static generation of each of these. Now, there's a version of this called incremental static regeneration. Um, and actually, I believe Cassidy was talking about it in a lightning talk earlier today. At the conference, she goes into a lot more detail on it. Uh, incremental static regeneration is essentially the same process, but it's updating an existing static page in response to traffic. Um, so if the underlying data is changing, it's basically rerunning that build process inspired by Stillwater Revalidate, which is a popular uh, but not well appreciated uh, cache protocol. Uh, and what it'll do is it'll actually serve a stale version of the page instead of the fallback while it's rebuilding that page and then swap in the new version once, once the build process finishes. Uh, caveats here. Um, there's some unknown SEO impact and again, bot compatibility, because again, especially on that first page, now, which is the fallback page, it's entirely client side rendered and it actually has no data. Um, so it's not quite clear how bots will respond to it. Um, if you go into the RFC on this, there's some indication from the next folks that they've talked to Google and Google has blessed it, um, but definitely waiting to hear back from folks on their experiences with it. Love to talk to folks in the discussion section. Okay, let's talk about dynamic techniques if you've got lots of pages. Um, so these fall into the category of using serverless server-side rendering plus a CDN. And uh, this is a little controversial, which I'll talk about in a second, but basically you're using server-side rendering to generate pages on demand in response to traffic. 
And this has a number of advantages. First, it's very easy to support lots of numbers of pages because you can basically dynamically generate these pages when you need to. It also has greater compatibility with legacy platforms. Because this type of pipeline is very similar to the pipeline that legacy platforms are using, there's less data pipeline re-architecture that you need to have. Now, what's controversial about this is some folks in the community are very dogmatic about what is Jamstack and what is not, and it needs to have static generation. And what I'd, I'd say here is that it's effectively Jamstack-ish when two conditions are met. First, when there's zero DevOps and no servers to manage. Basically, it's serverless given to you that a front-end developer doesn't have to manage scale with. In fact, it's the same serverless that a lot of Jamstack platforms use to power the APIs. We're just basically saying use it to power HTML data as well through server-side rendering. And then the second condition is really critical. It's when that data is being served from the CDN, from the edge. Um, because basically after the first cache miss, if it's served from the CDN, it's effectively as fast as say a statically generated Jamstack site. The requirement in order to do that is you need proper cache management. And it gets harder and harder to do as you have more and more pages on your site. And actually, when we had this debate earlier in today's conference, you know, when the two mats were debating, the WordPress mat and the Netlify mat, um, you know, Matt Billman from Netlify had a really great point. He said, I've run benchmarks and people don't typically cache their HTML at the edge. And that's really true. That's one of the innovations of Jamstack is it took data that typically wasn't being cached and actually brings it to the edge. Um, and when you look at conventional CDNs and how they're being used, most people are caching their static asset URLs, but they're not caching the HTML data. And that's really what's holding up your page load times. Um, and so at, at MoveWeb, what we've really worked hard on is something we call CDNS JavaScript that makes it maintainable to cache that data at the edge, even in a dynamic serverless server-side rendering environment as well. So, Seeding is JavaScript will give you powerful edge control over things like cache keys, headers, cookies, and more. And it works with your code. So it understands your code's, you know, your framework's routing. And it's a first class citizen in your development. You can run it locally uh, in your dev environment, and you can also put it on a preview environment, and it works again in production. Um, and your edge rules all live with your code, just like classic Jamstack. So when you roll them out, uh, those edge rules go with them. If you will do a rollback, they roll back with it as well. Encourage you to learn more. Check out, you know, on developer.moveweb.com, the cookbook slash guides slash cookbook. That's actually the best first place to start because it gives you a sense of the variety of capabilities and power of CDNS JavaScript. Um, the other key thing for cache management is being able to maximize your cache hit rates, making sure that you get those really good cache hit rates so the data is being served at the edge. So something we have built into the XDN is a performance monitoring that takes what normally would have been buried in your access logs and would be hard to understand in terms of when a page cache hit happened and when a cache miss happened and exposing it up to the developer, in a very front-end developer-friendly way. It actually understands your code. So display stuff in terms of your routes, not in terms of just a bunch of URLs. And we give you APIs for targeted AppAware cache clearing. So you can clear like just a particular page if you need to, or maybe a whole section of pages very precisely in response to an update. So we've seen you know, examples where somebody changed a product, and that product went out of stock, and then the underlying rest of the platform could clear out all the category pages that had that product and just rebuild them. And then finally, we have tools to help you diagnose when you're playing with the site, whether that response is coming from the edge of the origin. Um, and here you can see an example, this is on top of React Storefront, and it's actually showing you when a request hits, and if folks want during the discussion, I can we can load up a demo of this. It will show those responses coming in uh, through the XDN network. And this is actually really critical for one of the things the XDN does for you, which is it does prefetching at scale. And prefetching is really important for performance because it's a real paradigm shift to how you know you can unlock truly instant page speed. You know, traditional page speed, like you get out of lighthouse, is really focused on what happens after the customer taps the content. But before that customer taps the content, there's actually a lot you can start doing before they do anything. And you can actually make it so that no network request is even needed. Uh, effectively, the network then becomes zero latency and almost infinite bandwidth, as long as you stay just ahead of the shopper. And we can talk about more of the discussion as well. Uh, another technique, which is something we're uh, working on at MoveWeb and soon to be released, 
is SSR preloading. Um, and this is very similar to the regular server-side rendering pipeline that we talked about earlier, but we analyze the traffic logs after a deploy for what the high traffic pages are. And then we basically preload those in parallel to the deploy. Actually, we let the deploy happen instantaneously and then asynchronously let the pages start building for the high traffic pages. And this way you actually decouple the deploy from the building. So you get immediate deploys while also maximizing cache hits. And if a request comes in for something that's not high traffic, then it's gonna definitely get built of the customer waiting around forever. But if it's coming in for your high traffic pages, those are most likely to be cache hits. It's a great way to make sure you get the, the best possible cache hit rate in this environment. Uh, finally, there's mixed rendering. You don't have to choose just one of these techniques. Uh, choose what's right for each class of pages in your site. So you might declare, you know, your about us, your return policy, your blog, a static, and then have other pages like your cart, your products, your categories be dynamic. So the recommendation if you're doing this at scale is choose a framework and a platform provider that lets you flexibly mix the techniques as needed. Um, okay, a few of the other issues we've seen folks run into and then we can turn over to the, the more interactive session. So, um, the and I believe there's actually another talk earlier that talked about this. This is sometimes called incremental migration, gradual migration, progressive migration. If you're a fan of Martin Fowler, sometimes called the strangler pattern. And this is the idea that you don't want to have a big bang migrate of your site. You want to migrate a large site incrementally, not all at once. Try to build, you know move a mountain all at once, it's going to be hard. You kind of want to do it stone by stone. Um, and this really requires routing control at the CDN edge or origin. Um, here's an example on how you do this on the XDN using CDN as JavaScript. Uh, basically, you can see this first line is going to use all your Next.js pages if possible. And then if a Next.js page does not exist, it'll fall back to the legacy page when no Next.js version exists. So, you know, you start with maybe your product and your home page, And then if you say add your category and some additional pages, this will automatically pull those updates in and it will change the fallback routes as well. Uh, personalization and segmentation. Um, this is really, really important for large sites. And it's not just personalization, it's things like language, geography, localization, internationalization as well. Um, and for very large sites, they usually work across geographies and it's really important for the marketing team to be able to customize the content to users as they visit the site. Uh, the general guideline here is If this content is below the fold, we actually recommend you can late load it. You can client side render it. If it's above the fold personalized content, then you really do want it in the server rendered output. And what you need to do is make sure that whatever system you're using lets you segment and serve up different values of your static results or your server side rendered results to those different segments. Um, now, there are lots of ways you can do this. You can do this yourself manually if you want, and you want to hook up, say, Lambda at Edge all yourself together. Um, on the XDN, we make this really easy. Um, here in CDN as JavaScript, we basically can declare a new custom cache key and we can say personalize based on currency. Um, we've had a customer you know, do this before. I think one example is they had different prices depending on if you're Canada dollars versus US dollars. Um, and then you can also do this for personalization. You can have a user segment. So we had a customer who used this to customize the banners on their category pages as well as the sorting, or sorting order of products on their category pages based on whether somebody was a new visitor or a frequent visitor. Uh, and here you could basically just do that with a few lines in CDN as JavaScript. Uh, A-B testing. So A-B testing is again, something that's really important for large sites and large organizations where a lot of your critical decisions are ROI driven, like demonstrate for me that that will improve a conversion lift. And in Jamstack, classically, the only option you have is client-side A-B testing that runs in the browser. And the problem with that is it can result in poor performance and it can possibly nullify your test in two ways. One is it'll hurt the performance of your variants and it might actually erase whatever improvement you were going to get from the A-B test. Another less well-appreciated issue is that sometimes they've shown an eye tracking, the A-B test takes effect after the eye has gone past it. So, you know, you might have an A-B test up in the header and the user has scanned past that header after the JavaScript runs and made a change to that, that DOM element. So the ideal is that your A-B testing is actually delivered from the CDN edge. 
and uh, a lot of XDM plat uh, application delivery network and experience delivery platforms support it. Uh, Netlify does, uh, MoveWeb XDN does as well. Um, the XDN has a really powerful edge experiments engine. I just want to call out. Um, it'll let you route traffic to any you know branch of your code. Uh, this lets you run A/B tests, canary deploys, um, and it's got a powerful rules engine that will let you split based on probability, but a variety of different rules. So things like header or cookie values, um, even IP address. We had a client who it wasn't really an A/B test, but it was a canary deploy, and they would use IP address to canary deploy to the folks in the office every week before they push the build to production, and that gave them more soak time. So that everyone who's in their office can try out, you know, the site and notice any bugs, and it's kind of some extra QA as well. Um, so that that's capability in in the XDN uh, edge experiments that's really powerful, and I invite you to, to check out. Okay, uh, that's basically about the halfway mark. So uh, with this, we'd love to get started on discussion questions. So uh, we'd love to hear from folks. You know, how many pages is your e-commerce site? What build times have you encountered? How frequently do you update your site? What frameworks are you using or considering? Um, what's the CMS you're using? What's the underlying e-commerce platform you're on? And then what are you using as your build infrastructure? Are you using Netlify or Vercel? Or are you, you know, cobbling something together yourself? Um, and then you know, what else besides what we've listed here are the challenges you're encountered or worried about at scale? Um, and then, you know, we, we talked earlier, uh, which is about the, the debate of, of the day, uh, and really maybe for our community for the era, which is really the WordPress Jamstack discussion. So we'd love to hear folks' thoughts on that as well. Uh, so with that, let me open it up and see if we've got uh, any questions or thoughts. Uh, oh, we've got somebody here. Steve, hello. Uh, you're welcome to, to join the session. Um, you're on the Salesforce Commerce Cloud B2C. You're not using Jamstack yet. You've done some headless implementations on, um, on some other frameworks. Um, so I'm curious, Steve, if it's nine years old, are you using pipelines or controllers in that Salesforce Commerce Cloud implementation? And you know, what are the issues and challenges you have had? Let's see, I just, there we go. Looks like getting... Hey, Steve, welcome. Thanks. Um, let me change my audio real quick because I think you'll be echoing. Uh, but to answer your question, I've done them all. Um, I've been a uh, practitioner and a service provider on the platform for a while now. Okay. Oh, I think we just lost him. Is that better? There we go. Uh, it's still great. Uh, it was before, but... Um, okay. <laughs> But you were saying you've been on uh, you've been on platform and you said you've done them all. Does that mean all platforms or just? Uh, no, you were asking like uh, pipeline versus uh, controllers. Yeah. Um, you know, I started with pipelines, obviously, uh, yep. back nine years ago. That was all there was. Um, and uh, I, I've worked for uh, SIs, systems yep. integrators, for yeah. most of my career here. Um, done a lot of stuff. Uh, most recently, like the. Bobify project was for Under Armour, and okay. uh, that's been very successful in Europe. Um, but I guess my, uh, I think I answered most of your questions, but uh, I had another one for you. In cases where you're very heavily dependent on kind of a monolithic back end like Commerce Cloud, um, things like doing um, branch deployments where you're testing canary builds or whatever. Mm -hmm. becomes a little bit more uh, interesting, I think, or challenging, I would say. Um, but I, do you have any customers doing that kind of stuff on Commerce Cloud, or do you see that as more of like um, more true headless uh, customers? Yeah, we have, we have customers on Commerce Cloud. Um, and, uh, you know, the current state of kind of the way branch deployment works uh, is it's very code focused. So if the thing you're branch deploying is your headless front end, we can totally take you know, variations of that and, and tie it together so that you can kind of do a canary deploy of that. Um, as long as 
the underlying backend hasn't changed. And the API or even pseudo API, because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, OCAPI, you might have to kind of manipulate it to make it work. Yeah. Um, and so you're right, though, if you're trying something that's a lot more radically different, you then need to version out uh, and build out your own kind of pseudo API in, in a controller that's version. So, you know, you know, this version gets this version of the data and, and that does present another challenge. Another one that's emerging one and we haven't, you know, packaged it all up yet is the you know, kind of marketing features around this that are built into say business manager and that integration. Um, we're really first targeting kind of the developer, you know, empowerment angle of bringing the, the values of Jamstack. But that's something you know we've we've often talked about on the roadmap. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Looks like uh, let's see, um, we've got some more questions coming in. Oh, by the way, what's the largest size site you've worked on, Steve? Um, it's no, the company's no longer around. They went under a couple of years ago, but I would say we were looking at. Um, I think 750,000 products, which is okay. actually an area where like the catalog itself and the business manager starts to fall over at about 500,000 products. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a fast fashion brand and they just kind of never cleaned up the catalog. Yeah, too, really. too fast. They got too, 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 yeah, too fast. Yeah, too fast. Clean up. Wow. Faster than their customers. Yeah. The moral of that story, of course, is always clean up your data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's a that's a great example. Um, we've actually got a couple fast fashion customers. Um, let me see. I see a question from Matt. So uh, Matt asks, currently working on an e-commerce site with around twenty five hundred routes using Nuxt and Shopify. We have a custom CMS with content writers rapidly updating. Great example. So the main challenge we're facing now is. How to update the routes only when they've been updated in the CMS. So interested in learning more about how incremental builds work. Could this be triggered through an API call when the CMS content is updated? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things we have, I mentioned earlier, uh, let me go back to this slide here, um, app aware cache clearing. So we have the capability to let you very micro target your cache clearing so that only the page they have changed is updated. I used an example from, from Commerce where a merchandiser, you know, marked something is out of stock or changed its price. And now all the category pages it's on need to be updated. You can actually, through our system, tag those pages and then, you know, your system will just say, hey, this product got updated and you can clear all of those out. Um, so uh, hopefully, Matt, that answers your question. Um, and again, if you've got more questions, feel free to hit that button, uh, which lets you apply to get in. So also in terms of using a native static site generator for better performance, it's something like Nux that has its own static site generator. Do they integrate well? I'll be honest, I do not have firsthand experience with a native static site generator. I've only used uh, the non-native ones. Um, the goal of Toast from actually just talking with the gentleman today is to be a static site generator natively coded that is more JavaScript aware and more compatible with how JavaScript systems work and meta frameworks. That being said, I don't know if it'll actually work with Nuxt. And I can tell you um, from talking to the folks who maintain React Storefront, which is built on Next, that these frameworks innovate very rapidly. Um, and so what you might end up finding yourself is, you know, behind the latest and greatest features um, just because you're waiting for what you're on in terms of an SSG to catch up R. Uh, let's see, uh, Naveen is asking, follow up to Steve's question, do you guys see challenges with customers adapting to these new ways of creating and managing sites with respect to DevOps, IT rules, et cetera? Uh, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, yes and no. Um, it actually depends, and I mentioned this uh, and this actually came up in our booth, but in this slide, uh, I talked about team capability. Um, it really depends on the team you have. Looks like Daniel wants to join in. I will add him. Uh, let me answer this and then we'll let Daniel speak. Um, but you, there's that saying, you only go to war with the army you have. 
Um, and if your team doesn't have a lot of, you know, React, Angular, or Vue, these headless frameworks that are popular with these front ends, that's actually one of the areas, especially for large sites. Uh, this is something we had a discussion with the booth. Like, it's very easy with small organizations to be like, yeah, we're we're three to five developers. We all know React or are willing to learn in Next.js. But you know, when you're a large organization, you need to basically be planning team capacity. And technology choices are also about, you know, what kind of pool of developers you can recruit. Um, so one area that you know some of these teams are you know struggling with is they may not have uh, the the right team capabilities for it. Uh, another area is they might have to rejigger their allocation of their team. Um, a lot of the technologies we're talking about make some of the other roles less necessary to push out the same level of improvements or iteration capacity. So you may not need as much DevOps on a Jamstack or Jamstack-ish like platform if you're using something like serverless or Jamstack as an approach. And so in your planning, you suddenly now have to, to rethink how you're allocating your resources that way. Um, so team is one capability there. Uh, in terms of IT rules, um, again, it's the same type of thing. Some people aren't necessarily used to it and, and the IT rules haven't, haven't been um, vetted out. Uh, I do you know, think about how, and you know, the Matt on Matt debate alluded to having multiple services. Um, some of those services may or may not pass your IT or security, you know, review uh, as easily as they, they did in the, the previous approach. Um, that being said, the other problem is just re-architecting your data pipeline. So one of the things we've heard um, from one of our customers is he went with the server-side rendering approach because he didn't have to change his data pipeline. He could just kind of continue with the app the way it's architected right now. And he can kind of gradually do that, but he's getting all kind of Jamstack-ish like benefits now without that change. Um, and then the other area you didn't ask about it is back office workflow integration. So, you know, say you're on SAP Commerce Cloud, people are making changes in the comment, the what are they called? The cockpits, right? That's where your merchandisers work or where your content team is working. And maybe you're using the content manager that's built into your e-commerce platform, which isn't really designed to be headless. So you'll find things like styles embedded in your CMS content, or that back office merchandising tool wasn't integrated into Jamstack. This is again an area where for a large site, taking that serverless server-side rendering approach makes this whole thing a lot easier um, in terms of kind of compatibility. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Naveen. Uh, let's see, we have Matt uh, saying, uh, can't use video now, but would, oh, okay, great. Uh, and hopefully that answered your question. Looks like that answered Naveen's question as well. Um, let's see, we've only got, oh, we've only got four more minutes um, so happy to answer any other questions. Again, welcome to have people jump in. Uh, I'll highlight a few other things until the next question comes in that I mentioned here, um, which is incomplete APIs and customizations lost by APIs and database connection limits. So, you know, if you're on one of these, leg, you know, these old legacy e-commerce platforms, they weren't built API first. Right, And so what you'll find is that they have APIs, but the APIs don't have all the functionality of every single part of that site. And so what you'll sometimes find is they've got 80% and they're missing some, some piece of it. We've even seen examples of this um, on more modern platforms like Shopify. Um, one example that came to mind was they wanted to continue to use the Shopify uh, content and menu management tools. And so they'd be setting their menu headers in, in Shopify, but there's no API to get that out um, cleanly. So actually what we've uh, observed some clients do is they use the serverless tier to actually get that data uh, essentially through a synthetic API that looks at the HTML and they cache it at the CDN uh, and then it, it gets served up that way. So that's one way you can get around that problem with incomplete APIs. Another problem that isn't well appreciated uh, especially folks who are new to, say, you know, these these larger platforms or more monolithic platforms that were built with MVC, Model View Controller, is that there's a lot of customizations that are being done to the content in the controller level of the Model View Controller. And, you know, we've seen this in, in platforms like SFCC and Hybris, 
where you know OCAPI or in the case of Commerce Cloud uh, OCC, the API layer actually comes in and accesses the e-commerce platform below where the controller is. And so when you've put a lot of customizations in those controllers, those get lost. And so you might think, oh yeah, I'll just talk to my platform's APIs. And then you realize 50% of my functionality is literally sitting in those controllers. I have to recreate that logic now either client side uh, or I have to migrate it somewhere else. And you may not be able to migrate some of that logic client side. It might have you know, keys or security implications to put it client side. This is again where having a serverless tier is really, really helpful. You then move that customization logic into the serverless tier. Another option you can do is to actually kind of rip the head off, off the existing application and take the controller output, serialize it to JSON and use that as your pseudo API. That's something we've observed clients do on, on platforms like Salesforce Commerce Cloud and uh, uh, SAP. Uh, Hybris. Uh, last one is uh, database connection limits. Um, we only have basically a minute left, but the issue here is, you know, a lot of these legacy platforms sometimes have been built, uh, have been built kind of in the classic way where, you know, the application server is got a connection pool that it uses to talk to your database. And there's only a limited number of those connections. Um, and they weren't really designed for getting a connection from every single front end visitor to the site. And it's kind of, you know, uh, delegated off to your, to your, you know, application server. Um, and so that's something, uh, if you're really deep in the weeds, you might run into as well, is that if you try to just expose everything raw out to your, from your database to your front end, even if there's no security implications, and again, you make it, if you lock up security, your, your database may not be able to scale appropriately. So you might have to migrate your database or do something like, uh, RDS proxying where you pull those connections. So uh, let's see. Um, we have, oh, there's a plus one from Milo for ripping the head off. Uh, Steve has mentioned putting that technique to use. Uh, great to hear. Like a lot of people say you're crazy for this and then they've got no other choice. So great to, to know others have the scar scars as well. So I think we're right at, uh, at time. So I'm gonna thank everybody for their participation. Uh, it's 3.45, everyone have a great rest of their Jamstack conference. Thank you.